um, we'll get started. A few others might trickle in, but welcome everybody. Glad you are all here on this warm midsummer's uh, day eve, almost almost mid midsummer, almost the solstice. Um, we're going to start, as I mentioned, uh, with just a little bit of a catch up from Ben. So I'm glad he showed up. <laughs> and um, and after Ben gives us a, a bit of a news update on the Desert Lab and the Hill, then we'll get started with um, Deborah. So Ben. Okay. Thanks, Trika. Hey, everyone. Good evening. Great. Awesome attendance. Thank you all for making this. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Anyway, I just, I hope you're doing well, man. It's a, it's a slog these days. So um, it's good to see your, your smiling faces here. Um, and just grinding through, you know, that's all we can really do right now. So not a ton of updates to tell you the truth um, right now in that um, you're watching the news just as much as we are. And, um, and it's concerning. So I'll just, I'm, I'm not going to go into too many details, except that uh, that the, the hill is still open to the public and it's an individual's choice if they want to walk here or not. Um, our, uh, we've been not, we essentially we have a right now an unofficial sense of uh, how many, what percentage of folks are wearing masks and that's about 30% um, depending on a time when you're here. And that is definitely lower than we were hoping it would be. Um, but I think all of us have seen that uh, there's not a high percentage of mask wearing um, pretty much anywhere in wherever you go. So the, the lab is still closed to, um, to uh, office holders and, and the staff, um, except for the, uh, you know, the presence that Clark and I are handing, being on site and then on it continues to be um, working full time from home, which is, uh, gone very well like I mean I have to say that given the fact that we're all dispersed and not here like normal um so we the lab has maintained very active and being very productive at this time um focusing on elements that we can uh likewise the um Ural's role officially as steward is not able to resume at this time and as I've been communicating for the last couple months uh it's unclear exactly when it will be safe to, to resume that one and two when uh, officially we can allow that to resume under the university's policies. So thank you for hanging with us and continuing to educate yourselves about the hill um, until the time we can bring you on uh, back in the capacity you guys signed up for. So um, again, if you have any questions as this kind of unfolds, don't hesitate to reach out. To us, but I don't. I don't honestly expect much to change in our current status for um, for a month or so, just given how the trajectory of things. Uh, and that's kind of it. I mean, it's really you know status quo, whatever that means right now. You know, the things haven't changed in terms of where we're at from the last time we were able to check in. Uh, it's hot. Um, but the animals sure enjoy being by the building. And we have another uh, pregnant uh, deer who may be giving birth to some fawns fairly soon. And um, the quail are sure happy. They're all around. So anyway, I'll just pause there and just see if you all have any uh, specific questions. Um, another thing that I had um, said as I said this to folks was that perhaps uh, if any of you have walked the hill on your own, obviously not in your steward's capacity, um, and had anything to share, any observations or comments, um, I think we'd welcome that as well, if anybody had anything to share or any questions. You can either raise your hand or unmute yourself, and we'll give you a couple more seconds, and if <laughs> we hear from nobody um, at this point, then um, we'll go ahead and get started. And there will be an opportunity after the presentation for you to uh, speak up as well and ask any questions and maybe we'll have a bit of a discussion on Dr. Deborah Goldberg's amazing presentation. And um, I guess without further ado then,
I think some of you might have met Deborah up on the hill, and um, if not, uh, meet Deborah, Dr. Deborah Goldberg. Um, she is now um, also a, a DCC up on the hill, working with everyone, and um, is near and dear to my heart because when I was 19 years old um, and an undergraduate ecology student, uh, I served as an assistant, field, a field assistant to Deborah in the foothills of the Sierra Madre. And I was very young and very green. And she was um, an amazing guy to take me for the first time way back um, to uh, put me <laughs> to hard work as she was working on her PhD dissertation in that region. And maybe she'll tell you a little bit more about that. But um, for me, it's sort of full circle to come back and, and have the honor of getting to be working at the same place with Deborah. So, uh, Deborah, you're on. Unmute. First, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, well, thank you, Trika, and it's wonderful to be back working with you. Happy to talk about my dissertation in the Sierra Madre with anybody later, but I didn't put anything about it in this talk. <laughs> Not to Mama Kill. Um, but uh, part of why I am giving this talk is because I did work on Tumamak as a graduate student, sort of a side project on the permanent plot with Ray Turner, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go on. So they've always been very near and dear to my heart. But I do want to say that I have been at the University of Michigan for the last 37 years and not immersed in desert ecology. I've not been doing much desert ecology. So I'm gonna do a pretty deep dive into what we know about these permanent plots and what we've learned from them and ideas about, I think, what we could do after that. But I'm not gonna give that, you know, that really much broader context of how that fits into the whole literature because I am still getting myself back into that literature to figure out what's been going on. So I'm hoping that those of you who, and there are many of you here who know it a lot better, will chime in and especially answering questions that I may not be able to, to do. So be warned, you're gonna be asked for your, your opinion and some information. Um, oh, and I guess my other caveat is I was having so much fun reading and trying to get some more information that I didn't leave myself enough time to make it really look pretty. So for those of you who are more visually oriented, I apologize, it's gonna be a little dry, but that's okay, stop and just, and feel free to ask questions, just unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, if you raise a hand that I'm talking, I probably won't notice. So just barge in, and that's totally fine. Um, Trika, maybe you could monitor the hands. Would that be okay? Okay, great. But I, I welcome interruptions and uh, not interruptions. I welcome questions, comments as we go. Okay. So, let's. Are we shared? Um, yeah, we can see it. You can maybe make it full screen. There we go. Awesome. Okay, great. So I've given you my, my little uh, caveats to start. This is not going to be a broad um, talk about plant ecology research on Tumamak Gill. It's very specifically focused in on the permanent plots. And there are three sets of permanent plots that I know about on the hill. Um, the first are what we call the Spalding Shreve plots. These are mostly established in 1906 by um, Volney Spalding. And two more of them were uh, started in 1928 um, by Forrest Shreve. Then there are the Suwara plots that were established in 1964, but building on a 1909 study. Um, and then there are the desert annual plots, which were established in 1982 by Larry Venable. I am not gonna talk about those at all because there's so much fascinating work 
And so I think you guys should get Larry to talk to the stewards about all of this. So I just want, I think they should be included because they've been, these have been monitored every year for almost 40 years now, um, since Larry started at the university. Okay, so I'm gonna focus mostly on the Spalding Shreve plots, some on the Saguaro plots. Okay, and just a little bit on what do we do with permanent plots? Why do we talk about them all the time? And they're, the first one's really obvious. We can just document changes in vegetation. Which species are there? If, if because we're measuring what's there, then things as well as total structure, how many species, what's the total cover, total height, estimates of productivity. There are all sorts of, of things about the vegetation structure as a whole we can look at. And if we do that over a long enough period of time and also have environmental data like climate, we can actually start to get at the drivers of vegetation change. To what extent is it climate, which climate factors? Um, and so that's really important. And that the existence of permanent plots around the world is why we know so much about the impacts of climate change. I'm sure you've all seen reports about what climate change is doing, especially in mountain areas, changes, really drastic changes in vegetation. It's because we have these permanent plots. What might be a little less obvious about what we can do with permanent plots is when not only is the area marked, but individual plants are marked or mapped. So we can follow the fate of individual plants, how much it grows, how much, it, whether it survives, we can record new plants. These are all, you know, birth, death, and growth are the key aspects of demography. And if we know those, we can build population dynamics models or community dynamics models and actually make projections about future changes. And if we have those over long enough periods of time, we can say what's survival as a function of precipitation or recruitment as a function of temperature. And we can then build our models and go on to say what's gonna happen as the climate changes, for example, or we can introduce a disturbance. And these are basic tools. These kind of population dynamic models are the basic tools of conservation and now of climate change. So they're really important. Now I'm gonna tell you straight out, we don't have those models for Tumamak from those plots. And with those alone, for most species, we're probably not going to be able to get them. But we can get pieces of it that help inform this and relate to other work that can really help drive this. So for me, this is actually almost more important because this is the kind of work that enables us to get at more about what some of the mechanisms are going and the, and the projections. The Spalding plots started in 1906, and I'm sure you've all heard this, are the oldest plots in the world where individual plots are mapped. I should say that we know about, or rather that James White, who wrote a 1985 paper on census and vegetation knew about. Um, I'm, there are probably some others somewhere, but this is what we know. And that's of course very exciting. There are, oh goodness, where did those arrows come from? There are, um, many other permanent plots now. Yes, these are the oldest and they're really important and I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about them, but there are now many global networks of permanent plots around the world where individual plants are mapped and they go back and remapped with really standardized protocols. And I could spend an entire talk about all these different networks and what we've learned from all of these other networks of permanent plots. I'm just highlighting one because it's been really, really important in the history of ecology. And that uh, these are the forest dynamic plots. Um, this is a map of, of the how many there were around the globe in 1915, I'm sorry, 2015. There were 59 of them. These range in size from two hectares. Now that's 10,000 square meters. The Tumamuk plots are 100 square meters. So the smallest of these plots is huge. Uh, 
contains thousands and thousands of individual plants, all of them marked, measured every five years, et cetera. Um, this has been an enormous resource for ecology and we're getting a lot more of these. So the idea of permanent plots is really what a lot of ecology is about these days. And it started here. So, so let's dive into Tumamak. You all know the Desert Lab was started in 1903, carved by the Carnegie Institute. The very first visiting investigator who came was Volney Spalding. And now here, I have a really nice personal connection to Volney Spalding. He had been a professor of botany at the University of Michigan, where I was on the faculty for 36 years. And um, he, around the corner from my office in um, sort of the grand stairway, there had been a plaque that I never looked at. It was there, you know, I passed it every day, multiple times a day for many years. And I finally one day looked at it and it was a plaque to Volney Spalding. Um, erected by his former students in honor of his faithful service as a teacher of botany at the University of Michigan. So I was really close to him there and that was, and that connected really well with my time as a graduate student on Tumamac and working on the Spalding plots. Um, he had a spectacular short career after his retirement at, um, at the Desert Lab. And McDougall, the first director of the Desert Lab said, I know of no one in all of America that I would rather have as a first visitor. And he's responsible for some of the things we now think of as the most important things at the Desert Lab. So in 1906, once they real decided that yes, the Carnegie Institute Lab was gonna keep funding the lab, it was gonna stay there. Spalding established 19 permanent plots. Um, most of them were 10 by 10 meters, not all of them. Um, and that same year, the entire area was fenced. So this pink line, um, can you see my cursor, everybody? Okay. Um, the pink line is the fence and there'd been ca moderate cattle, burrow, horse grazing around the lab, especially on the flat areas, less on the mountain slopes. And so one of the ideas that Spalding had was to look at the recovery from the vegetation, from cessation of grazing. So the plots in yellow and in red on this um, map, on this photo, are the original Spalding plots. Many of them, the red ones are lost. They couldn't, you know, they, we've not been able to relocate them. So he mapped them in 1906, did a kind of cursory map of a few of them in 1910, and then nothing happened. And then uh, Spalding became somewhat ill and did not continue to do much work after about 1910. And then Farah Shreve came in. He established two additional plots. One is this green in the southwest corner called Area B. I love the area B because it's actually eight plots, eight 10 by 10 meter plots all put together. So you actually have a decent sample size um, to look at some things. So area B, we'll, we'll be using that some. He also made another plot, green plot called area A, which has never been mapped. That just had counts. So it really wasn't, um, didn't really go with all the rest of these plots. Um, in 1957, Ray Turner, who I think was then still at the University of Arizona, he later moved to the US Geological Survey, um, took over responsibility for the plots. The 1957 mapping was a master's student, Anne Murray, under um, the direction of Ray. And he and others in the USGS, then Bob Webb at the USGS, basically kept sort of custody of the plots and organized their remapping ever since. These, this is just a, a list of all the years and the plot numbers when they were mapped. And you can see that a bunch of them were lost until 1968-69. So these first four, number 14, nobody remapped them until Ray 
um, found them again in 1968. So he was responsible for reviving those. And most of those have since been mapped in all the subsequent map, in subsequent times. Um, it's about every 10 years, eight to 10 years, but there are some longer gaps, most notably between 1906 and 1928. It's also important the 1906 maps mostly don't have cover. I'll show you that in a minute. So we don't know how big the plants were at the very beginning, and that's rather unfortunate. Um, not This uh, table is from Jan Bowers in 2005, who, who used the data for, for some things. Um, they were mapped again in 2010 um, and or 2012. So all of these plots that were done in 2001 were done again about 10 years later. So um, bam, we're due. <laughs> And um, I hope that's under discussion and figuring out how to get funding for it and et cetera. But we are definitely due. I, I have to tell you, we got a, I got the green light. We have the money to hire a postdoc. I yes. found out today. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. That's fantastic. Okay. Because, well, we'll get more on to all the exciting things that, that could be done with these data. All right, that haven't been done yet. And here we go. I just have to point out that in 1978, it was while I was a graduate student here. Trick, I think we went to Mexico in 79. Is that right? No, no. It would have I been. I think it was 79. It might, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's me actually on Tumamak actually measuring a saguaro. Oh, that wasn't one of the Spalding plots, but you know that was me when I used to be a skinny little thing. Okay. So here are some plots. Um, this is B7. It's a series of photos over time. Um, all of these plots also were used as repeat, repeat photography sites by um, Ray. So they're archived photos for all of the plots over the years. So starting in 1958, um, this particular plot, you can see some increases in, and there's a saguaro that regenerate came up in, the, in um, sometime between 86 and 2009, might be in there. I didn't go back and look at the original maps. So the way the plots were mapped was you take a 10 by 10 meter plot, surround it with string, that's what we did, and then lay out string to make one by one meter square grid. So, you know, every meter put another string out across the plot so that we had a one by one meter grid. And then you take a piece of graph paper and you draw the, the you know, you locate exactly where each base root stem is, um, root crown is, and then you draw the crown around it. So, and then if they're overlapping canopies, you can see those overlapping canopies. And, um, and then when I did these, it was before, I didn't digitize, this was before we digitized all of these to figure out how big the plants were, I counted squares. <laughs> I did a lot of counting little squares on these graphs. That's not how we do it anymore. <laughs> Instead, starting in, uh, the 1993 maps, um, they use surveying equipment, what's called the total station, that measures from one point, from this instrument, to um, points that are then moved all around. So for each individual plant, you get a reflector, and then the instrument measures the horizontal angles, the vertical angles, and then to get, and the distance to that point. And then you can go around the canopy, do the same thing and get the edge of the canopy. And then all the software counts up, generates the maps and calculates all the areas. So it's a very different and much nicer way of doing it. I think at least the first time they did it, they got a professional survey company to do it. And I don't know if that's what will be done again. Um, one of the times they did it. Okay, and then you generate maps that look like this. And then you have a ton of maps and what do you do with them? Or especially if you don't have to re, 
do um, count squares. They are now all, even the older ones, digitized. So in, well, I can't remember what year, but in the late two, 2000s, Larry Venable got a grant to convert all of the data to work on the permanent plots. Um, and here's where Ben might kick in if I've got this a little wrong. What they did is they hired a postdoc, Susana rodriguez Veritica, who, and Susana, with the help of others, they digitized everything that hadn't been done yet um, and developed algorithms and programs for generating all the data on cover and density and for matching from one plot to the next. So you have a map, but if you're going to use that to actually get the demography data, you have to say, well, it's this dot. Is that dot the same plant in the next map? Which actually is not quite in the same place, but maybe it's the same plant and because there's always error of at least a couple of centimeters in this. So that all is now, as far as I know, automated. Is that correct? The, in ArcGIS. What? In ArcGIS. Okay. Anyway, yeah. And the, the other piece is that the other person that was really important in putting it all together was Bob Webb, who, yes. like uh, Ray, was uh, employed by the USGS. And so when Larry brought on Susana, Bob uh, also worked very closely with her and to, okay. to digitize all this. So there's two things. There's this publication here, which is a kind of a static um, archive of, of this published. But then there's a, a, a much more robust, uh, you could say dynamic GIS, um, kind of a geospatial database that has uh, was well, like 160 gigabytes in, in file size. Um, and that uh, Frank Reichenbacher, who's on the call, is an associate researcher with the lab, has been um, working with him because it's been about, as you kind of no, uh, noticed or mentioned, since about 2013, people have gotten their hands dirty with the data. So Frank's been working on kind of getting a sense of where all that stands. So then we have it in pretty good shape for oncoming postdocs who can, who can work with them. That's great. So if you want to look at the data, this is what's called the data paper. Ecology started publishing data papers, which basically just record especially valuable for these kinds of long-term data sets. So anybody can get access to these data. It's all the, there's you know, all the metadata about all the information about how everything was collected, all the description of the plots, et cetera. Then all the data files with density and cover, the digitized maps, the keys to the photographs and other archives is all there. Um, so that's one way it can be done. The other way is through the data set that Frank has been working with. I asked Frank if he wanted to give this talk, but he didn't. Because <laughs> um, he knows more about what's going on right now than I do for sure. Um, so this, um, so this was a huge, huge job getting all this together. What has not really happened since then or even before then is a whole lot of analysis. So what you have in 1929, Farah Shreve reported on the first two mappings, 1906 to 1928. He then published another paper after the 1936 um, mapping. Notice one year later, 1937. Um, then I worked with Ray on the 1978 mapping. And then we worked on and published a paper that actually had some analysis, did a considerable amount of analysis of the data. And that's a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about. The um, it was one paper about one, as one small aspect of the plots in, tw in 2010 by Brad Butterfield, along with Ray and, and um, Julio was also at, at uh, USGS and John Briggs. But um, they're really, as far as I know, and I've been able to find, there has not been um, a major reassessment of the plots since that 86 analysis. Now, again, people jump in if I'm wrong. There have been a few 
smaller studies that have used a couple of plots and data on one species to as part of other studies to look at some of the demography, but there hasn't been a major assessment. So we're also way overdue for this, for actually using the data to look at things. So I'm gonna give you some results from this 1986 paper and then a little bit of stuff from this last paper um, before I go on to the, um, um, the saguaro plots. Deborah, can I interrupt you just briefly? I do think that Frank was raising his hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. Well, that's, that's okay. No, I just wanted to point out that you're right about the analysis. It really is time to analyze the data yeah. and, and make something of it because it's been more than a century. Yeah. It's ideal. Yeah, it, it is. And so, and I would love to talk with you some more about that, Frank, and, and anybody who's interested. So I'm not going to start any new projects in retirement the way Baldwin <laughs> did, but I would love to help other people on projects. <laughs> okay, so here are the questions I'm going to talk about. Um, some of which we're not going to get very satisfactory answers as others we're going to get some really interesting answers. So there are, as I sort of mentioned earlier, three kinds of things we can do with permanent plots. Um, we can look at the dynamics of the vegetation as a whole. We can ask, does the vegetation, that whole plant community, um, track climate? Uh, you know, abundances go up when it's wet, go down when it's dry. Some really obvious, you know, sort of predictable things that we might expect. Does, how closely does the vegetation track climate? Another thing we can take a look at is, because we had that fencing, how does the vegetation respond to a lack of grazing? Do we see any continuous trends that don't seem to relate to climate that might be due to grazing? Um, and then the question is, it's just how stable is ve desert vegetation overall, or this desert vegetation? That is, you, know, you can say individual species go up and down, but say, do the dominance stay somewhat consistent? Does the sort of aspect of the vegetation look consistent? And so we'll ask those three questions. Then we'll move on to some questions about demography, the fate of individual plants, and a little bit about mechanisms, about processes, and we'll get to those later. Let's start with the dynamics. So if we're gonna talk about how vegetation responds to climate, we have to look at climate. And these is, um, just through the 1978 mapping, showing extreme wet and extreme dry periods over that. It's using what's called the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And what we're actually plotting is the number of months where you had wet conditions that were extreme relative to what had been normal, or the number of months that were extremely dry. The dotted lines represent mapping period, mapping times of years when we map the plots. So the, this immediately tells you one of the problems is in using these kind of data at infrequent intervals to relate to climate, relate vegetation to climate, because you have like this interval through the teens and the twenties, you have some really wet times, but you also have a really dry time. So, uh, you know, what's this responding to? How is it, how is this mapping integrating those? We have no information on response separately to this wet and this dry. So what we did was to just take periods between maps that were consistently wet, like this period between 28 and 36. And it's really the only one we've got. Um, so we can look at the difference between the 1928 and the 1936 mapping and say, can we see peaks in, in, in abundances here or peaks in recruitment in response to this? Or we can take periods that are consistently dry, like this period between the 48 and 59 mappings, 57 and 59 mappings. They were done in both years there. They were spread out a little. Okay, there's another, in 1975, only four plots were mapped. But that was right after, or kind of during, a really dry period. 
So we might be able to see some signal there. 1978 was odd because the mapping was done in the middle of a really wet winter. And you'll see we do get some response to that really wet winter. Okay, so I'm going to use these colors, kind of blue for wet and orange brown for dry. And this is, I know it, it's going to be really hard to see, but here is again um, that climate, here's a consistently wet period, and then what the data are, these horrible graphs are it's a whole bunch of species and don't really worry about which ones they are at the moment, but going from 1910 to 1978, looking at their cover, the amount of surface area over the plot that they covered over time. And the different lines in each one of the graphs are just different plots. So they represent spatial variability. Um, that wet period is in this blue box here. And you can see a number of species, but not all of them do show peaks. Um, this is Triangle the First Age. It's got a really nice peak right there. Uh, White Ratney has a nice peak, uh, Slender Genuzzi has a nice peak, Menadora has a nice peak, Caliandra. Ca um, Palo Verde down here does not. It just continually increases in this plot. It decreases in some others. It um, peaks elsewhere. It's the trouble with the Palo Verde, and so you can kind of ignore the data for Palo Verde from now on, it's one or two trees per plot. The plots are just too small for something as big as that. So uh, you really can't look at any vegetation trends from, from Palo Verde. More interestingly, a punch of Versicolor, I couldn't, what is the common name of a Versicolor? Baghorn Joy. Baghorn Joy, thank you. Um, shows kind of the opposite. It's at a low at that wet period. And, you know, it's one species with one low. Does that mean anything? But it's an interesting thing to think about is do the cat, there are many other cacti and they don't all show a, a, a low, but this is the most common one, the most common of the joy is there. Okay, so what about at the dry period? Can we see a hint of that? So here is the dry period and only for maybe two or three species. Burst sage again, up at the top, triangle first sage, white ratney down here, shows a nice little dip for that dry period. Maybe wolfberry shows a dry period. But the other species don't seem to be responding to it a whole lot. Um, and this is in cover. The, uh, Brittle bush, the second one over here, does respond in d number of plants. Um, but it doesn't respond in cover, so in size of plants. Okay, you do see this one line is that 1975 mapping, and you do see a big dip for a whole bunch of species there. It was done right after this really dry period. <coughs> so, so you can do all this, and it's, I personally don't find it very satisfying. I like to do statistics. <laughs> I'd like to have you know, statistical confidence in what I'm seeing. This is all very anecdotal and you can't, we just don't have enough replication. You can see how much variability there is between plots. The longer the record goes, you know, we're another um, 40 years out here. That gives us a lot more data to start looking at this because we can use time and fluctuations as a as part of our source of replication, but at least for this, I was um, not as satisfied as I would like to be with um, what we can see. We see the really coarse level patterns. Um, okay. Response to grazing, this one is also a little odd. There are two species that seem, seem to mostly show consistent increases over the whole period. Uh, this top one is the white ratney, and then the slender here, and then the genusia. Um, at least in numbers, 
um, and in most plots. That's that 1936 peak that we saw in the other, other plots. So, and white rat meat is supposed to be highly palatable to cattle, so maybe this is a response to grazing. Again, I'm, fair, I'm somewhat skeptical. A little better for that is looking at simply total density of plots in different areas. The Bajada, the pediment are where there was more intense grazing. The mountain front, there wouldn't have been any domestic grazing on those steep slopes. And you do see an increase in the total number of plants. And that parallels oops, one study in 1957 where they did a static comparison of the number of plots, the, the num the, um, of plots inside and outside the fence. So that's got a control. Our, our changes over time don't really have a control. So they're suggestive that in the early days there was some recovery in numbers, um, but we don't have cover, so we can't tell about that, but we do have numbers that go back to 1910. So there may be something there. Um, but that, of course, is our longest interval, and it would have been nice to know what was going on at a shorter time interval. Okay, so this one's kind of iffy. Here's one that I feel fairly confident about, the overall stability of desert vegetation. We did here was to take the relative cover. So yeah, individual species go up and down in their abundance, but if we say how abundant is creosote what percent of the total cover belongs to creosote, even if everybody goes up or down, perhaps that percentage cover, that degree of dominance stays the same. And indeed, mostly that's what happens. Again, ignore these two arrows are the Palo Verde, and that's growth of one or two plants. So this, you know, that's one plant growing, this is one plant, kind of, you know, a couple of plants dying over time. But most of you see the same three or four dominant species in, you know, similar, roughly similar orders in most of the plots. At least I'm convinced you are. The one exception is creosote, this line here, in one plot that just crashes in plot 16. And instead, white ratony kind of comes up while it's crashing. And you'll see later, it just, it never regenerates. All the plants in this plot were there at the beginning in 1928 and never regenerated. So what happened in this plot is really bizarre. So there certainly is room for dynamics. <coughs> and from photographs, it's the same around the whole area. It's not just one particular plot. So you pick up some really interesting oddities that we really don't know. And there's lots, of, we, we have speculation on some things, but this is a plot way out on the flats with a big caliche layer. It doesn't respond to climate. You know, this was a, a wet period right here. And it's, that's while it's declining. Um, but other than that, I think the dominance is, at least I would argue is relative. But again, we don't have a good way to do statistics on this, although maybe when we have longer periods, we can do something. And I'm clever, and, and a lot more people are a lot cleverer about some of the statistical analyses now than we used to be. Okay, so we've got some general conclusions. We have learned something um, about the vegetation, and you can read all those words if you want, but don't worry about it. Um, but I'm going to make the argument, and here's where I'd like to see some pushback from people like Frank and Ben and, and, and others, that I'm not sure we can do a great job on how well we're tracking climate with these plots. The measurement intervals are pretty infrequent. Um, the plots themselves are small. They're diverse, so we don't have large sample sizes of any one species, except for a few species. So, you know, we can do better after, now that we have another 40 years of data, but I am um, 
I th it's better than nothing, so we certainly need to try, but I am a little skeptical about these. On the other hand, I'm, I'm much more, I'm very high on what we can do with demography. And again, especially as we go for longer periods of time. So we can ask a couple of simple questions. We can ask our recruitment mortality, so new birth and death rates. How associated are those with extreme weather conditions? That's subject to same, the same problems, but we can try it. We can ask just how rare are recruitment events um, by looking at the age structure over time. And then one thing I found particularly interesting is we can ask questions about how survival, recruitment, um, growth, how are those related to each other? Do species differ in kind of consistent ways? Can we come up with these syndromes of how, of different and classify desert plants into different types based on their demography? And if we can, that gives us some way of maybe thinking about how they're going to respond to future change. So let's look. Here is, um, start with something with creosote in one plot, area B, this is one of our big sample, this is our big sample size area. So um, this is the number of plants. And in each of the map years, we have separate numbers of individuals for each cohort. That is, when did we first see those plants? So if we look at this, the, there's only one column in 1928, because that was the first time we mapped the plot. So all the plants, we're calling it the 1928 cohort. They could have come you know, from 50 years ago. We have no idea. Okay. In 1936, we still have the exa almost exact same number of 1928 plants, this bar. And we've added new plants, this dark bar that came in in that interval. OK, so stop me if this gets confusing, because these are pretty awful. Um, in 1948, we still have, God, nobody died. We have almost the same number of plants from, that were born in 1936 or by 1936. And we've added a few more that came in this interval. Fourth bar are the new plants in 57. This little tiny bar, new plants in 68. Whoa, what happened in 1978? The right bar are now there was a, that was that winter rain and a ton of seedlings. One thing you can't look compare necessarily because they didn't necessarily do seedlings every year, every mapping. So, but there's no question we had a ton of seedlings there. I really want to know what happened to them by looking at the subsequent maps. So, What's cool about this one is, look, what's the highest bar, even in 1978, excluding all those seedlings? It's plants that were there 50 years before, and none of them died. And yeah, you get a few new ones coming in, but not a whole lot of recruitment going on. It's remarkably stable. But now here's that plot 16 I mentioned before, where it just crashed. That cover, you saw cover going down. Here it is again, but no recruitment. Um, well, actually, there are a few seedlings <laughs> in 1978. A few little plants over there. But, um, and who knows where they came from because there were no adults, very few adults around. Um, so there's certainly a heterogeneity here, but overall, Recruitment and mortality is low, and it doesn't seem to relate much to climate. Uh, the biggest cohort after that 1928 is in the wet year, plus all these seedlings, which may or may not survive. I should say that these new cohorts are probably not seedlings most of the time, except this year. They're juveniles. They've probably been around for a year or two or more. So we call them juveniles, not seedlings. Okay, so eh, the recruitment may be linked to climate, but mortality certainly isn't. You know, you don't get a bunch of things dying in that bad period. 
Um, this mortality isn't really, maybe there's a little more mortality here at the end of that bad, during that bad period, but there's not a whole, and if you look at all of the plots, there's just, it's not very linked. Okay, here's some more species, bursage, white ratony, brittle bush, genusia, the same kind of thing. I'm not going to ask you to look at these in detail, they're horrible. Look at all the, here's your cre creosote back there. If you look at all the other species, um, well, first, they all have a 1978 peak of seedlings. There were seedlings of everything that year. <laughs> we got really tired of mapping them. <laughs> um, so we really want to know what happened to those. But even without that, most, in many of these plots, ambrosia, sorry, bursage, the rightmost bar, that is the newest plants, the ones that were born in that most recent interval, is usually the biggest um, for ambrosia. So it's got a much younger age structure. It's turning over a lot faster. For brittle bush, you never have more than one or two bars to the right. So mostly you just have ones that came up in that last interval. And maybe you have one from a previous interval. So they're not older than 20 years old. They don't last that long. So we can get longevity out of these. And then there's all sorts of stuff in between. White ratony is actually, it hangs around a long time. Um, you've got things that are still from, you know, in 1978 that are still from the, that were there in 1928. So there's, um, there's a lot of variability, but from this kind of information, we can find out a lot of stuff about the demography. And without going too nuts on all of this, I um, wish I could see your faces so I knew how many of you were falling asleep. <laughs> Some of you are, you know. Uh, we're, I'm with you anyway, and I suspect everyone else is because you've got all your participants still here, and it's fascinating. Okay. Oh, and okay. I, I'm certainly coming up with questions, but I also want to follow along at the same time. All I right. do see one hand. Oh, I saw a hand up. Lily had a hand and then it went down. Lily, do you have a question? Did you want to interject there? Your hand is up, Lily. Unmute yourself. I can wait till the end. Oh, is this, I, what I, would you prefer, I'd Deborah? Rather have a quest, I'd rather have a question now. Uh, okay. All right. So because of the high variability, maybe, okay, if it's not due to the climate, wet or dry, is it due to the soil? Has anyone done a core of the soil? Oh, good question. There are seeds there that we may have missed during one of the non-coning times, but the yeah. condition was so dry, was too dry that the seeds did not uh, sure. see things. Yeah. yeah. So for, it could well be soil, but that's not going to explain any trends over time. Or, it would have to interact in complicated ways with the trends over time. So, I mean, I think like that plot 16 with the creosote crashing, we suspect that is a different soil. And uh, it's that really shallow caliche layer. Frank, you got ideas? Yeah, that, that just the number of potentially confounding variables is almost too many to calculate. Yeah. That, that's what we're up against. Now take, take saguaros, for example, right? We had a big freeze in 2011, right? Almost no saguaros that following year flowered. Yeah. Okay, so right there, you have a year, maybe two or three years of almost no reproduction, or at least initially drastically reduced reproduction and then gradually getting back to normal. Before mm -hmm. another freeze hit in 2013, right? So saguaros are not that different from other plants, although they have a different strategy of, of uh, adapting to, to, to their uh, precipitation regime, which is monsoon. So they flower before the monsoon, so the seeds can be ready to disperse when the first monsoon rains hit. 
then yeah. the seedlings have a chance to establish with the first monsoon rains. And then if they can establish that summer, great, then they can have a chance to survive to the next year. Other plants do it differently, right? So uh, riddle bush flowers in the same period that, that swallows do or a little before, but the seeds really don't uh, germinate in the summer. They wait a whole year. They have to be cold treated to right. germinate again the following spring. So if that, if the spring that you get, you're looking at uh, uh, brittle bush is good, they flower a lot, the seeds disperse, the next spring comes along, the seeds are ready to germinate, there's no rain. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, you've got, we're looking at one measure of climate. <laughs> yeah, this, I, I am sure there are signals with a much more sophisticated analysis and you know, people who do these sorts of climate analyses these days have, you know, are doing much more complex analyses and where you're many more different climate variables. <clears throat> but you still need really large sample sizes to pick up a signal. And that's what I'm afraid we don't have for this kind of stuff. Right. Um, because if there's so many, as Frank says, so many confounding variables. So we get the big patterns. And, and we need more uh, monitoring periods to make sense of yeah. it. So, yeah. so, you know, four or five periods of every 10 years monitoring is not enough to get right. a grasp on what's happening. But our That's why we're coming up to now we have a chance to make some real sense of it after a century. Um, we're open. So, but... But here is something that I think we can say that to me was new and not obvious and, and pretty reasonably based in the data. So this table at the bottom takes some demographic characteristics. Um, how long do they live? Um, we know it's kind of a minimum longevity. I don't know why I call it maximum longevity. It's a minimum longevity estimate because of course, some things live a lot more than the 72 years we have measured. Um, juvenile survival, how often, do, what's the rate of survival from one census to the next, the first sentence they appear to the next sentence, census. Okay, so not seedling survival, which undoubtedly is much, much slower than that, but juvenile survival. Long-term survival, plants that were there at least 50 years ago, what percent of them survived for 50 years? And then uh, some estimate of kind of turnover, if you take the 1978 population, how much of that is from 1928, from that first, the first big mapping? Um, and because we don't have 20, 1910 and everything, or 1906 and everything for all the plots, okay. So it turns out you can group all the species. We had, oh, I forgot to check, 30, 40, 50 species maybe all told that show up in the plots. Um, you can group them and classify them into distinct groups based on these characteristics. So you have large shrubs and trees, very long lived, high juvenile survival, and there's no reason these should be associated. You know, just because you live a long time and you survive, long term you survive really well, why should you, do, you survive well as juveniles? So I find that really interesting. Um, a lot of the population dates back at least 50 years. So these are things like Palo Verde, Creosote, Whitethorn, Wolfberry. Um, you have other things that also live a long time, but they have lower short long-term survival and short-term survival, and the population doesn't last as long. Here we have the white ratney and surprisingly the Genusia, which is not a very big. It's a pretty uh, slender looking thing. You have a group of small shrubs and cacti that um, still live a long time, maybe not quite as long, but they have low short-term survival. A lot, sorry, they have low long-term survival and almost none of the population in 1978 
comes from, is 50 years old. You have a group that's all kinds of different growth forms, a bunch of cacti in there in particular, much shorter lived, um, lower survival and no long-term survival. And then finally, you've got these small shrubs, some small cacti that just, uh, they barely live one, um, maybe just over one census period. So we just don't get a whole lot of information on them. So why do I think this is interesting? Because we have this, oops, we have this continuum from these species that have that have really slow turnover and infre infrequent recruitment, those are likely to re re be really slow to respond to changes in climate or to disturbance. Because you basically got those adults that just hang around forever. They don't die, and if they're not dying in response to climate, you get a really t long time lag before you see a signal of, of recruitment, of, of um, any kind of change. So, these are what um, what ecologist has called, they're kind of like the walking dead. You know, a species may be on its way out because it's not recruiting, but because the big, large, visible plants are hanging on, they look like they're doing fine. Okay, so these are actually ones that we need to watch out for. We need to really keep an eye on recruitment for those. At the other extreme, um, these groups, D and E, they're small, they're short-lived, they're gonna track climate a lot better. So if you wanna know something about effects of climate change, you track these populations. If you wanna track, um, but these are not gonna tell you that much about climate change. Maybe they're covered, but certainly not their birth and death rates are probably not gonna give you a whole lot about climate change. So this is the kind of thing that I think we can get out of these plots and we can do a lot better and make these estimates much more, uh, improve these estimates a lot with the next round of plots, next round of censuses. Okay. Um, oh, I already talked about this. Okay. So we can get some things about demography and I think this is gonna get a lot better. The last thing I want to talk about real briefly is um, what processes drive vegetation dynamics. This is really, this is what my research mostly has been about over my career, especially about how plants compete or facilitate each other, and they do both a lot. We all know about nurse plants in deserts. Well, remember those maps where we had cover, you know, had canopies overlapping on that, that graph paper, piece of graph paper. Well, we could actually look at those neighbors say, is recruitment more likely to happen? Do we get new plants coming up under those canopies? Or are they more likely to come up outside of a canopy because they want to avoid competition? So, and then you could ask, because we have so many years, we can ask, how does that degree of facilitation, if it's there, change? So this begins to get at some of the processes. So this is a paper by, um, oops, I forgot to give the, um, give the citation here, but it's by Butterfield, it was published in 2010. They calculated from the maps um, of what they called a recruitment niche score, just basically compared the number of new recruits you'd expect in the open relative to how many you might expect given the amount of open ground. So, you know, you have to say if more occur in the open in one plot or one year, but there's more open ground in that year, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So you have to get an expectation here. So we won't worry about how it was calculated, but just a positive score means it's facilitation, it's nurse plant, a negative score means competition. And then plotted that against simple mean annual precipitation. So each point here is a measurement interval, a census interval. Um, the mean precipitation in that interval, and then whether there was facilitation or how much facilitation there was. So the first thing is all the values are positive. It was always nurse plant. This is for all species altogether. Again, sample sizes weren't big enough. 
to look at different species. That's where it's going to get really interesting, but maybe next time we can, next round we can do it. But to me, what's really fascinating here is the more rainfall we had, the more facilitation you got. Um, the more likely plants were to do better under a canopy. And I find that really odd. I would have thought the opposite. So here's where I want my ecologist friends to jump in. Why? <laughs> Anybody know? Anybody have ideas? Actually, I, I have a question. Why would you think that um, you would have expected the opposite? Because with more, I mean, this is a desert. This right. is not Michigan, right? So <laughs> plants, do, <laughs> plants do need that uh, more protective oh, environment in a nurse plant. This is not, but this is not the number of seedlings. You'd expect that to go up. This is the proportion of them that come up under canopies. So this is how much do they need that nurse plant, basically. And I would have thought the more water there is coming down externally, the less important having a nurse plant would be. Oh, curious. That is interesting. Hmm. So now it may be, I, I don't know. It may be that there's so few, I don't, I don't know. There, but, there are other factors coming in too with a nurse plant. The, the shading is an advantage. So, in, and then the, the protection in freezing. So it's going to aid and abet recruitment you know, on both counts. Right, so maybe this is, so what they didn't do is relate this to temperature. So again, this was a very simple analysis because we only had six data points. Right. Stick in a bunch of variables, but yeah, good that, point. Great. Deborah? Yeah. I, I, I wonder if it's got to do with the accumulation of leaf litter and other detritus underneath the nurse plants with increasing biomass. Oh. So, so there's yeah. more stuff down there to shade and shelter and hide and conceal right. those seedlings. And, and in addition to that, the nutrient load, it's, it's nutrient. that played, that uh, island effect of nutrients. Right. But does that vary so much year to year? With yeah, it can. I, I was just going through some photographs of my Tumamoko work from 1984, uh -huh. and the difference in, 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 in the local biomass around some of mo those old Tumamoko plants and today is mm -hmm. just startling, depressing, yeah. actually. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the really strong islander fertility effects. I was just not thinking about how much that really operates over time. I mean, not over time, this is not age of the plant, of the right. nurse plant. This is the environment. And this is lumping all years, you know, these are just different cohorts. So, I don't know. I mean, those are all really good ideas and it'd be really nice to have more data to actually begin to test those. Um, so again, cool hypotheses that are being generated here. Um, okay, so let's see. These are kind of, well, let's talk a little bit. That, so that's all I'm gonna say about the mechanism stuff. <coughs> we don't have very much. So as it's been, I think, clear from everything we've been saying, there's a whole lot more that can be done. We have some sense of, yes, there's, the vegetation changes a lot in absolute terms, but in relative terms, not so much. Um, I would actually like to see us think about more frequent intervals, but you know that's, that costs a lot of money because I think we could do a lot more with it then. Okay, I think the demography, what are the next questions there? I would love to understand what are the specific traits that cause those differences in demography among those different groups of plants we, we identified. You know, what is it about being long lived that makes you have low juvenile survival or, um, you know, what, are, there, are there things about the long lived plants 
what are the traits of the long-lived plants with low turnover versus some of the other shorter lives? Is it, you know, something simple like wood density? Um, you know, can we get a little more at the mechanisms that are driving those differences among plants? And then I started with one of the reasons it's really important to have individual plants and know their fate. That's how we can develop models of population dynamics. That is a model of how the population is going to grow. You've all seen population dynamic models ad nauseum during the COVID epidemic. You know, the pandemic models of disease spread are population dynamic models. Um, if we want to know what's going to happen with plants or anything as the climate changes or as we do disturbance, we need to be getting models of what those dynamics are. And that means we need measurements of birth rates and death rates and growth rates. We need to know those birth and death and growth rates as a function of the environment. And then we can say, what happens if temperature changes this much? What happens if it changes this much? What happens? We can do all sorts of cool things. Um, and while we can get some of those data here, and we'll be able to get more. Um, we can also use these plots to validate those models. So we get a model maybe using data from the plots and from elsewhere, or maybe it's all independent data. Then we say, well, that predicts under these circumstances, this is what's gonna happen. Well, we have the plots. Let's model what actually happened in the plots and see if that's what we get. If we use independent data to parameterize them. That says, oh, we've got decent models. We can trust them a little bit. Or maybe they won't be decent models, but we could try. So I really think putting more effort into this kind of work is, is part of what I'd like to see. So taking this all to the next quantitative level. And then finally, we can do a lot more with the interactions. The Butterfield paper just scratched the surface of that. We can look at... Um, effects on growth rate of individuals as a function of their neighbors. We can look at how close plants are. We can do all sorts of things um, with these maps to look at both positive and negative interactions. So, and then if we actually, that will just tell us interesting things on their own, but if we actually get somewhere with that, we can then put those, add those further into um, those models. So there's all kinds of stuff we can do. Some of it might require us to change maybe more frequent. Some of it just more data, but I'm, I'm, it was really fun kind of looking at all this together, reminding myself all of it. I, you know, I did write that paper in 1986. So there's been a whole lot of reminding myself of just how much fun, how exciting some of this stuff could be going into the future. So. I had also had a whole, a small piece on the saguaro plots, um, but I want to leave us time for discussion and it's already a quarter to seven because I've been talking a lot. Um, Trika, should I just, I can just not do this and then we'll just have time for discussion. You think that's okay? Yeah, probably given the time. I mean, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat, but we really only have a um, we have about 14 more minutes and I always like to honor people's time, but I don't know how, how many slides you have there. Um, it's fewer. Um, I'll tell you what, no results because that's what takes a long time. Just what the plots are and the results can be another yeah, time. Scream okay. through that and then I certainly have some questions and I yeah. bet others do. And I just want to say, Deborah, it's been fascinating. I, as long as, I mean, I haven't been at the Hill that long, but as long as I, I, I haven't had this deep dive. So this is very awesome, thanks. Good. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, we, we come back to Volney Spalding. Because in 1908, after he did all those permanent vegetation plots, he said, oh, but the saguaro is iconic. And he mapped all the saguaros. Every single dot on this map is a saguaro on Tumamak and Sentinel Hill. And that was in 1908, so we had that map. And then in 1964, Rod Hastings and Ray Turner overlaid four plots, the north, east, 
and you know, in all four cardinal directions, the north one had to get broken because of the buildings in the middle, um, that overlay those maps and they numbered, put a number, a permanent tag, and measured every single saguaro. And they know, so you count up from the maps how many were in each of these plots in 1908. And then we know, and then they were remapped in 1970, in 1993, and over 2010, 2012. So here is the core, this is demography. This is not a problem with sample size. <laughs> It's, you know, yes, and it covers four different habitats with lots of sample size in each of the four habitats, face okay, so each of the different aspects. So this is really powerful stuff for getting demography. Um, again, Susanna and, um, and Bob Webb and Larry Venable and a bunch of other people all um, worked on getting the, the data from all those maps digitized. There's now an ecology um, archives paper, a data paper with all the data available in public. The two, the main publication on this is a 1998 paper by Betsy Pearson, um, who was one of the people who worked on this, and then a more recent paper by Susanna um, Veridica. Um, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just point out one number, one number. Um, in 1908, on the east plot, there were 410. So in 1964, there were 1,148 saguaros. The population more than doubled. It increased still again in 1993. Okay, not as drastic, but it also increased in the west side. It increased on all four sides. So the saguaro population had been growing. On the other hand, there's not a whole lot of regeneration going on. From these are the ages of plants in 1993. Just take this one down here. A lot of plants are between 19, came up something like between the 1920s and 1950. That's the age of most of the plants in the plot. Not many new plants date from since 1950. Very few new plants. There has not been a whole lot of regeneration. And again, that's true on all four sides. So we did have a big peak in the first part of the century of regeneration. Actually, you go back, there was a peak in the 1850s of regeneration that some of those plants are still around, were still around in 1964. Not much regeneration going on right now. Again, these plots are also due for another mapping. Has there been regeneration since then? But this is the kind of thing that we have enough sample size. We have annual, because we know the age of each one of those, and that's another story about how, we know exactly when these started. This really demands uh, another analysis. And Susanna did some of that, but in a complex enough way that I'm not going to be able to get into it. <laughs> But um, I'll leave that because there's some really cool stuff here that maybe you should get Bob Webb to come and talk about the saguaros. That's what you should do because he spent a lot of a lot of work on these. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, bottom line: <laughs> vegetation change, eh, demography, yeah. <laughs> My personal opinion. I'm open to debate. <laughs> Questions. Well, I'm going to say, first of all, that was awesome, Deborah. Awesome. Um, and and I, I should have asked um, this question way back in context, but I was, like I said, on the edge of my seat. So um, I don't see any other hands up at this point yet. So I'm going to ask this question. Um, and it's about brittle bush. It was, I was very interested to see that it's not considered long lived. It was what in your E group. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I it was, was D, I think. Um, I think it was D. Oh, I'm not quite the, yeah. 
don't remember exactly either. Ever, well, I mean, but either way, <laughs> right. you know, how, how long? I mean, they, they just they're they're so darn resilient. I was really surprised to see that. But yeah. they are the smaller little shrub. Do you how approximately how long lived are they? And um, uh, what else can you say so, about it? Yeah. So the maximum longevity that we see for it in these plots is between 10 and 20 years. Um, oh. We just don't see any that seem to be living longer than that. That doesn't mean they can't, but oh. we're not seeing it in these. I'm, you know, it's when they live that short, the, the shorter they live, the more accurate our values are. You know, right. If they live more than 70 years, we have no clue. <laughs> So that so, leads me to my second question. Then I suspect Kiki has a question following me because she's unmuted herself. Kiki, you go next. But real quickly, I was going to ask um, the uh, um, analysis that you had and you were continually saying, I want to look at recruitment um, and mortality past the year 1978, you know, following your paper. Are, is someone doing that? Because it seems like we have those data, correct? Oh, we have they, them. They be analyzed? So there have been, um, Jan Bowers did one paper published in 2005 that used some of the seedling data, um, but I don't think it used, it, it was only, it was not in all the plots and she followed, she mostly marked some additional seedlings in other cohorts and then followed those. And that was only a six year study. So uh -huh. it's not really parallel to these, but I don't think she had those big, um, I won't swear to it because I was reading a whole lot. I don't think she used those big seedling cohorts in those, the 78 cohort. But um, Ben or Frank might remember. Yeah. But Jan. So we potentially have those data for future analysis. We, have, we absolutely have them. And that would be an easy thing to look at. And I actually thought a couple of days ago, oh, I really should do that. And I just, you know, I <laughs> getting into this whole new data set was just. I, it, that's going to take me a long time, and I have to get my data analysis skills back up to speed. So how about Kiki? Did you have a question? No, I just was thinking, like, some of the smaller ones, how tasty are they to some of the herbivores and, wow. you know, the deer and the heavily right. and the critters? Yeah, great Mice. question. I That's something I'd love to hear from other people, is, like, they're any kind of compendium of degree of palatability <laughs> of two different her herbivores. I mean, something that's like something that. To look into. That's actually a, a really good point because you're looking at competition among other plants, but but there's essentially this a uh, whole other um, exactly yeah uh, predation by animals um, right and pressure that could easily be be going on. And what we don't have that I know about at least are, are any data on populations of you know, jackrabbits or you know, any, of the, any of the herbivores. You know, it'd be really nice to be able to have that along with plants. You know, I can imagine a beautiful analysis. We had degree of palatability, we had density of the ant herbivores, but we don't have this data. <laughs> well, and maybe it's a great question. And if somebody wants to go and search through range literature and or somewhere and try to find some information on this, it'd be terrific. Those data do exist. Um, but what I was going to say is now that we're starting to put up cameras and, and monitor mammals, exactly. Exactly. we can add that to the yes. data for future oh, reference. Cool. That's so cool. Great. But what, what also don't forget, javelina were actually uncommon in the area at the start of the two oh. Mock Hill Desert right. Laboratory. Right. Mm. They are only just now becoming com common the last 30 years. Yeah. And they have a dramatic effect on certain mm. things. Well, there's yeah. the deer there too. Yeah. And deer. Mm. Yeah. So that's a great thing to look into with all of these data. <laughs> 
Indeed. So are there other questions out there? Um, yeah. Um, Deborah, uh, this is Muffin. Um, when did buffalo grass start to be oh. uh, bad invasive? What, how did that affect the plots or has it? Good question. And um, Jan Bowers has a paper on exotics. She actually has two papers on the history of exotics on Tumamak, and there's actually a year in there for buffalo grass, but I don't remember it offhand. I, think I can help. But I don't years. think what? I can help with the years. Okay. So the it was first observed on the hill in 1983, uh -huh. but very, very, very low density, um, and just a, in a couple small little spots. And mm -hmm. then by the late 90s, it had uh, begun to be the monoculture that it kind of is now, that mm -hmm. large infestation, which has then just kind of continued to double in size since then. But by the late 90s, it had so between 83 and then really like mid 90s, 95, 96, 97, that's when it jumped. So that'll be a really interesting thing to add into in that because I perennial grasses are mapped. So um, most years, <laughs> they, some people said, I, I, I guess a few people didn't want to, but we know when they were mapped, when they weren't, you know, from good field notes. So we'll be able to look at the impact, potential impact of buffalo grass on the rest of the vegetation. That would be a really nice candidate for looking at some of those, doing neighborhood analyses from the maps. That's a great, yeah, great question. You know, we've got great ideas for what to do next. <laughs> yeah. Got our next century lined up. Oh, yeah, we do. Next lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? We're coming on to the top of seven. Um, yep. I don't see any other questions. Um, I, have a, I have a question before we wrap up. Um, so I'm, I've been thinking a lot about uh, so mapping from above, right? So mm -hmm. talking about the different methods that were done from the graph paper to the um, maybe even some like uh, the lines with the, with the plots to the total station. And now I'm thinking a lot about aerial imagery, right? We drones, we need drones. One <laughs> so in terms of, I'm one, so clearly using aerial imagery to do redo the mapping of the plots, but I'm also thinking about the areas we haven't previously, yes. not the plots. Right. So how can we use the plots to calibrate and train understanding of um, the, oh, the landscape? Point. Good point. Really great. Yeah. I mean, I could imagine doing, you know, LIDAR with field checking, because I think there's a lot of stuff the, you don't see the smallest stuff with that so you've got it's got to be combined with field work but mm. but i could imagine um some kind of drone operated aerial imagery um centered around the plots but with say another 10 by 10 mm -hmm. meters around it or more so you could actually look to see and you know, as we go forward, how representative is that plot yeah. is of the surrounding area to, you know, get to, to use for some sort of calibration. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great idea, Ben. I love that. I like yeah. that, that kind of you can sequentially go bigger. So you have an adjacent yeah. 10 by 10 meter right. and then 100 meter and then scale right. out. So at what point yeah. do you lose the, uh, yeah, the ability to extrapolate? Right. And you could actually, um, you, yeah, you could actually figure out the degree of, you could do a spatial analysis to see yeah. how that tails off. Yeah, cool. But d drones can be hired to, to photograph in different bands. Uh-huh. So you can get different sorts of information out of some of the imagery. Mm -hmm. well, I'm thinking about LIDAR because that gives you the surface. Yes, combined. Um, so you, you have can to do a whole volume. combined thing, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, wow. Okay. You're all on the team for doing these analyses <laughs> going forward. Any other questions or comments? Um, Deborah, I, I stopped sharing your screen just because we were having a conversation. And oh, we should. I, I see everybody's faces. I know. Yeah. I, I forgot to do that. Thank you. That's okay.
Uh, any other questions? This has been really fantastic. I'm so many, I'm glad so many people joined us, um, but it is coming on the hour and I want to respect that. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. It was fun. Thank you so Thank you much, Deborah. We did record this. So, um, yeah, kudos. Get that out. Thank you. Great. Great to see you all. Yeah. Look forward to the next one. <laughs> When somebody Great else work, is going to do it. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs> yep. It's exciting. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Well, good, good night. Everybody. Bye. Adios. Good night. Adios. Bye. Bye.